Let's dive into social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism hard-coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Carolyn Coles Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other, the growing impatience in the distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or a revolt, nor does it fade out. Welcome to the great stagnation. We, the online billions, are stuck on the platform. Nice total strangers on the street because you saw them on your friend's page. Your Facebook friends know you're pregnant before your family does. You choreograph your picture taking according to what would make a great profile picture. You know exactly what your ex from 10 years ago had for breakfast this morning. You don't see the point in reunions. You already know everything about your former classmates, including the potty habits of their children. You ask your spouse to change your Facebook password temporarily so that you can get some work done. You break up with your girlfriend by changing your relationship status to single. Ouch. If you want to know the results of a heat game, Marlins game or presidential election, you check everyone's status updates. You didn't get that great job because your would-be employer saw photos of you doing yellow shots while topless. Your lawyer uses your ex-status updates in court to milk him for all he's worth. Your just out of jail childhood friend jacks your TV because he knows exactly when you check in at Coldstone Creamery every day. The cops track down your kidnapper because you checked in at the mall and had not been seen since. wants to end a 20 years friendship over the posting of a picture. Your sister's friend, ex-boyfriend, says he liked your wedding dress. He wasn't at the wedding. At the wedding. Once we're locked in, the path to infinity has been locked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now, toiling around in the micro mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair like everyone else. 
Franco Berardi observes the mental state of today's students. I see them from my window, he writes, lonely, watching the screens of their smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to their expensive rooms that their family are renting for them. I feel their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. In the social media era, the Oblomov position is no longer an option. In particular, for those who cannot economically afford to get stuck within the abyss. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only interpassivity inter was ever really implemented in code, instead of being just another Austrian idea, we would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, there's nothing passive about human-machine interactions. Being on social, the Zen status of detachment is an ontological impossibility. We are never really lurking. Our presence is always noted, and we can therefore never truly enjoy the secretive voyeur status. Interaction in our tragic existence <clears throat> is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms, and rank our taxi drivers. arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now, Jaron Lanier asks, why do so many favorite tweets end with the word sad? He associates the word with a lack of real connection. Why must people accept manipulation by a third party as the price of a connection? According to Lanier, Sadness appears in response to, I quote, unreasonable standards for beauty or social status or vulnerability to trolls. Google and Facebook know how to utilize negative emotions more readily, leading to the new system-wide goal. Find personalized ways to make you feel bad. There is no single way to make everyone unhappy. Compared to others, your ranking is low, and this makes you sad. Even technological sadness is a style. Abide a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. 
This is what happens when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the brief in-between moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of our current situation and onto another playing field. Filled with mini reports, we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're sad in our very own way. As there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore, the result is fatigue, depletion, and a loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time, meticulously measured on every app, tells us right in our face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention and show that I'm still there? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through.
Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early block culture tried to update the diary form for the online realm. But that moment has now passed. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the state of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real-time regime. Instagram stories, for example, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day, like a revenge act, a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness, a flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. The frequently used sad label is a vehicle, a strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container each and every situation can potentially be qualified as sad. Through this mild form of suffering, we enter the blues of being in the world. When something is sad, things around it become gray. You trust the machine because you feel you're in control of it. You want to go from zero to hero. But then your propped up ego implodes and the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. We long to revolt against the restless zombie inside us, but we don't know how. Our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to behavioral modifications. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world. After yet another app session in which we failed to make a date, purchased a ticket and did a quick round of videos, the post-dopamine mood hits us hard. The sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless. After a dive into the network, we're drained and feel socially awkward. The swiping finger is tired and we have to stop. Accelerating, accelerated, acceleration, accelerating, accelerated, acceleration. Human becoming not an app. Human becoming is not an app. Human becoming is the actual act. Human becoming is a virtual act. Human 
becoming is not the girl. Human becoming is the actual act. Human becoming is the actual act. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression, and burnout. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everyone is depressed. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition. Don't never say never, because everything can be turned into one. No matter how brief and mild, Sadness is the default mental state of the online billions. It's the original intensity that gets dissipated. It seeps out and becomes a general atmosphere, a chronic background condition. Occasionally, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. A seething rage emerges. After checking for the tenth time what somebody said on Instagram, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable and we want to put the phone away. Am I suffering from the phantom vibration syndrome? Wouldn't it be nice if we were offline? Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we need to quit again? To go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, to arouse us. And yet, we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. Let's compare the fleeting sadness in its technical form with the ancient state of melancholy. The melancholic personality seems to suffer from a disease. Unable to act, she withdraws from the world, contemplating death and other transient phenomena. While some read this condition as depression and boredom, others reframe this lazy passivity as a creative strategy, waiting for inspiration to strike. Instead of a fascinating derive into the vast arsenal of literary resources, I propose here a digital hermeneutics that short circus philology with the eternal presence of the digital that surrounds us. Melancholy, once described as sadness without a cause, has strong existential connotations. While paying tribute to Kierkegaard, who liberated melancholia once and for all of its medical stigma, describing it as the deepest foundation of, a, of the human in a godless society, the problem here is not a vertical one of going deeper, but a horizontal one. The democratization of sadness happens through its thin spread across our plateau. Homeopathic doses flatly distributed via technical means.
Melancholy is a thing of the past because there is simply no time anymore to indulge in a wistful state. One could, of course, defend that techno sadness still bears the possibility of melancholy. The implosion of the factor time has all but sabotaged the possibility to seriously drift off. Real time machines constantly draw us back online. Capture our attention and do not allow extensive mourning. Strangely, melancholy requires concentration and focus. Distraction, on the other hand, is all over the place, and sadness is microdosed. The metric to measure today's symptoms would be time or attention as it is called in the industry. While for the archaic melancholic, the, the past never passes, techno-sadness is caught in the perpetual now. Forward-focused, we bet on acceleration and never mourn a lost object. The primary identification is here, in our hand. Everything is evident on the screen, right in your face. While confronted with the rich historical sources that dealt with melancholia, the contrast with our present condition becomes immediately apparent. Whereas melancholy in the past was defined by the separation from others, reduced contacts and reflection on oneself, today's tristesse plays itself out amidst busy social interactions. In Sherry Turkle's phrase, we are alone together as part of the crowd. A form of loneliness that is particularly cruel frantic and tiring. What we see today are systems that constantly disrupt the timeless aspect of melancholy. There's no time for contemplation or Weltschmerz. Social reality does not allow us to retreat. Even in our deepest state of solitude, we're surrounded by online others that babble on and on, demanding our attention. But distraction does not just take us away from the world. This is the old, if still prevalent, way of framing the fatal attraction to smartphones. No, distraction does not pull us away, but instead draws us back into the social. Social reality is the magic realm where we belong. That's where the tribes gather, and that's the place to be on top of the world. Social relations in real life have lost their supremacy. The idea of going back to the village mentality of the place formerly known as real life is daunting indeed. Checking. 
emotionally present. Check, 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 check. Checking, empty and indifferent. Check, 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 check. empty and indifferent. Check, 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 check. Information overload. Information overload. How can we redesign the social in such a way that it will become impossible, even unthinkable, for trolls and bots that try to disrupt our thinking and behavior to occur? We cannot spend all time and energy to reinvent the social without taking freedom into account, not the liberty as defined by right-wing libertarians, but freedom as, for instance, Hannah Arendt and Isaac Berlin speak about. This is not just freedom from addictive and manipulative software. Can we rethink bots and algorithms in such a way that they become pets and toys, tools that work for us, instead of invisible, oppressive systems that try to deceive and educate us. Technological freedom means the ability to put them aside, to turn them off. We long for tools that assist us instead of colonizing our inner life behind our backs. Our sadness will not be overcome via anger. We need to reinvent the techno-social in a radical manner here, right now, in Berlin, in Europe.
We are not sick, everyone. <laughs> no, we are not sick. <laughs> we are not sick. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for this. What shall we call it? You call it a form of theory jockeying at some point. Yeah, TJing, um, theory jockeying. Um, yeah, but it's it's very primitive, right? It, this can be done in a much <laughs> more. But it's it's. Uh, uh, this is. Uh, we're waiting for the backup yeah, dancers. We're, we're at the very beginning of something, and uh, this is only the second time we've done it. So the yeah. premiere was in uh, uh, November at the uh, Impact Festival. So. Yeah, so this follows on the heels of your book from last year, Gert, mm -hmm. Sad by Design, yes. on platform nihilism, um, which uh, is also out in German, right, on transcript as yeah. Digitale Nihilismus. I'm not sure if both are sold out, but Sad by Design was sold out, I think, on our opening night already at the House de Cultura. So it's really nice to have this kind of new form of presentation of your work together also with uh, John Longwalker. And uh, I'm gonna be very short. I'm gonna actually hand over to the audience um, because we wanted to kind of let you maybe also ask some questions uh, after this experience. And also to maybe plug that there's an album coming out of this as well in spring. I Suppose? Yeah, it should be in uh, April. I think we're, we're planning the release party now. So I guess the question is to kind of appropriate something that we had as a tagline for the 2014 Afterglow Festival already, itself appropriated by a famous tech slogan, how do you feel today? And uh, maybe the audience members, they want, if there's some questions, you can kind of start by also uh, yeah, answering yourself a question to make this a bit more dialogic. How do you feel? And then throw back a question at this How guys. do you feel? <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> we want to you don't have to do that. That was intimidating. But uh, exploit your suggestion. feelings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have questions, questions. or comments, yeah. or just yeah observations on this phenomenon of sad by design. Thank you for that, that was great. Um, I'm wondering what you see as the relationship between like viral media or memes and sadness um, and the way they were used in your practice. Like the, what do viral images tell us about sadness today, for example? Yeah, um, well, since 2017, there's much more known about this. Uh, before that, I think uh, average users were kind of guessing. Uh, there was not much uh, written about it. Uh, but obviously, since Cambridge Analytica, we, uh, we know more uh, f through uh, a number of whistleblowers from uh, Silicon Valley uh, how these uh, behavioral modifications exactly work. Uh, there's a lot of uh, behavioral uh, psychologists uh, involved in this uh, process. And so um, it is, let's say, a s very sophisticated form, what in the past was called human computer interface design. Uh, but this goes well beyond, let's say, 
the ordinary uh, design question of how uh, you know an app should look like or a website. Uh, um, so there's there's um, a lot of research invested into uh, you know us not going away, <laughs> putting the phone aside, but maybe going back to it. And this is what I've tried to describe um, in in the essay that it's a, it's too much. Obviously, it's too much. You put it away, but you're drawn back, and and it's this this media design. Uh, you know, that um, uh, is creating uh, this whole very, very confused, mixed mix of feelings. Anger sometimes. It also depends, of course, a lot on, on the question of uh, age, gender, background. You know, of course, there is not one way to respond, right? And, um, uh, but these companies are trying very, very hard uh, to um, uh, keep us there, and, and that's the sole purpose of it. Pond. Um, I was, I was, I'm curious about the role between sadness and melancholia that you touched upon, and um, and uh, maybe the question could be uh, if if. If, if we get sad by social media design, uh, as, as, as you described, then is, is, your, is, is your, the thing you just did, is that melancholic? Yeah, of course, yeah, I'm often described as a deep uh, romantic person myself, as a 19th century uh, figure. Uh, so, um, yeah, obviously I have a, a lot of uh, positive uh, uh, relations, ships to melancholia and the way it is described, right, in the literature, in the history books, in theory. Um, but, yeah, the, the, to find the, the, the current uh, manifestations of it in today's society, uh, yeah, I had a lot of uh, 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 problems with that. So I, I used the melancholia uh, as a kind of a, a mirror to hold up a mirror and say, you know, uh, how, because this is such a rich, uh, let's say, thing that, uh, you know, already two and a half thousand years uh, we've, we've, we've been uh, reading about it, speculating about it. Of course, it has changed over time, you know, throughout the, the, uh, the centuries. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, the sadness, the, the melancholia uh, of today, uh, comes up in, in a time when people feel that there's no way out, right? This is the problem. Uh, what, this is why it comes up. When, when you get stuck, not only stuck on the platform, but with your job and uh, some kind of uh, no longer seeing any, any uh, way out, right? And, um, um, and this, this is a, a condition we find you know, amongst uh, many, many uh, people. And obviously there are also, of course, economic and ecological, uh, et cetera, reasons for that, so. Yeah, in, in fact, sad by design, it, it, yeah, it, it includes neoliberal uh, economics inside of there, yeah. I have a question back there. I had one, if about, Women speak first. Thank you. Thank you. This was really great. And I'm actually in the middle of reading the book and really enjoying it. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, you mentioned um, as a potential solution that technology should assist us and care. Um, and I'm wondering what the implications of that are and whether, you know, that probably is going to be potentially dangerous as well. Um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Oh, yeah, obviously, I'm not a, a big advocate of the European uh, offline romanticism, right? Where we say, OK, if we just switch it off, everything will be OK. Or if we do a, di a, a digital detox uh, uh, weekend, um, this is not uh, my strategy. So I'm much closer uh, aligned with uh, what um, Rule and Amerique uh, have uh, presented this morning. Um, 
where we introduce really radical other uh, uh, you know, experiments with uh, how we can redefine the social or what I call, you know, the techno-social because I don't believe that there will be a social anytime soon outside of these technologies, right? That, that this is a kind of a, a romantic notion that there is still a community where we have real life and real connections. Well, you know, that, that's just not going to happen. We need to radically uh, dismantle these technologies and, and really take that into account and, and to just say, okay, put it aside, yeah, that's just not going to work. We have to confront it, we have to fight uh, platform capitalism, we need uh, really, really uh, radical new uh, designs. And uh, the idea that the individual is going to compensate this yeah, through mastering uh, as Peter Sloterdijk uh, maybe called it still uh, 10 years ago, right? We don't need to master social media anymore. Uh, the, 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 the behavioral scientists uh, on the other side of the screen, they are way too clever <laughs> to, uh, you know, to understand even our deepest desires. And they even understand our desires uh, to go offline, right? So this is not an option. Can. Um, so the messages are really clear. A lot of people won't won't see this show, unfortunately, because you're you're telling like that we all need to take action to transform. Um, so, but maybe that's not enough because there's so many people who are being captured by a billion-dollar company enterprise that, as you say, has evolved to something or devolved to something that really has a war chest to to capture us to continue working on also alt altering their thing to keep us locked in. And so don't we need also to look at ways of uh, sabotaging these companies that have unethically uh, stolen the profits from what the internet could have provided society? They have um, abused us, and we really need to take action against them directly in any way that we can. I know, and now we're talking, with, we're now talking really about strategies. This is really uh, important. Uh, We've been, you saw the timeline this morning, right? The, uh, the experiments to develop al social media alternatives are already a decade uh, old, right? Already a decade we've been developing, and the latest, okay, we've seen that, that's Mastodon and so on. Um, but um, the, the problem there, and, and this is what I found in my work at the Institute of Network Cultures, is that we, when we emphasize too much on, uh, on these, let's say, small and radical experiments, we kind of lose sight of uh, the, the, the really um, very, very worrisome um, mental state of what I call the online billions, of the young people that I work with, right? And, so, uh, and we cannot just say, oh, you know, we have these uh, radical alternatives here, uh, and just uh, start using them and, and then it will be fine. No, it, it doesn't quite work with that. One of the strategies I, I'm in favor of is to you know, open up and to speak about the real existing mental mess uh, that is out there, including the addiction, including the fact that many, many people hate their apps uh, but can't uh, you know, delete them. And, and, and this is, a, this is a, we're in a trap uh, here, and we need to discuss how to get out of this. Sheila. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to talk facts and numbers infrastructures for a moment. Um, it's one thing to call um, radical experimentation, fighting the techno-social, but as you've just answered the previous question, and very correctly so, the infrastructures, in a sense, are fact. Okay? Um, when you look at the numbers, you look at the statistics, look at the market, and I will talk search engine because this is what I do and this is what I know, 92% of all queries go on Google. And this is a very, very, it is, it, it, it's impossible to even emphasize how bad this is. Can we, there are, uh, uh, can we devise a viable strategy, approach, mode, to addressing the, um, the current situation. Well, the infrastructures are ruled by the big tech, by Amazon, by Facebook, by uh, Microsoft, etc. 
in a way still that will not require the user to become a radical techno activist, that still works, fits within the daily routine because we all have our lives and we all have our laundry to fold, um, and still proposes, still starts to create cracks in this impossible cave that we live in. Yeah, I think this is possible, but it's not possible uh, only if we believe in uh, European regulation as such. Uh, because this is really, uh, because then we are only regulating, let's say, American uh, industries and, and uh, Chinese uh, uh, hardware, right? But this is not, uh, the, we sh should have uh, more on offer. It cannot, it cannot be only regulation, right? Uh, we need to develop our own uh, alternatives and this is why you know, for, for a long, long time already we've been try saying the radical critique has to go together with the development of, uh, of uh, you know, our own uh, experiments. We cannot uh, s separate and, and, and only look at Brussels and say, okay, well, uh, you know, and maybe we need, uh, we, we can learn something from Extinction Rebellion and, and the strategies like that, right? To do a blockade uh, uh, of data centers, etc. That's where uh, I would like to see things going. I just on a, on a really small note, um, regulators have definitely failed us. They're way behind and were way corrupt and they've just woken up very, very late. And I think that maybe we should, let's say, get dirty ourselves and get into business, hack uh, the uh, uh, venture capital system in order to infiltrate it with our methods, adapt it to it in a certain way in order to open it up for further yes, discussion. And, we need to get our hands dirty. It's very clear that social media, in my view, uh, should be part of, of what we could call, you know, a public I infrastructure or something like that, right? Uh, and should not be developed by venture capital uh, and, and, and follow, again, the same logic where, uh, uh, you know, nine out of ten companies die and then one uh, survives and this whole um, um, kind of a tragedy of, uh, of the monopoly uh, that, uh, that we s see happening now, which is the result uh, of the Silicon Valley va venture capital um, strategy. I just want to add that um, we have had um, a moment uh, when the internet was smaller, uh, but through the, the grassroots efforts to adopt Firefox against Internet Explorer 6, we did change the infrastructure and the capabilities of the internet. So uh, that, um, Firefox is fast again, so give it another try and uh, tell people about it, tell people about DuckDuckGo. Uh, I've seen it happen, we actually did it before, you know, it, it was a different world back then, but I, I have some hope. We have one more question, or well, where is it located? Manuel. Maybe we can take two, it depends on how long your question and the replies are. Hi. Uh, okay. Um, I have a, a question about the way you're using um, sadness uh, in terms of kind of universal affect and the way you're using we, sorry, I'm here, we and us in your talk. And I'm thinking about particularly uh, work by scholars like Fred Moten on Afro-pessimism. I'm also thinking about Sarah Ahmed's work on the cultural politics of emotion. And I'm struck by a kind of, a really, to me anyway, problematic universalizing of the discourse of experience of sadness that you're offering here. And that that's replicated also in the presentation. So we had a kind of series of images without attribution, without a sense of where, what, when you found them. And I, I understand that in some ways you're performing this experience here, but I can't see what that enables in terms of a further conversation to just reproduce uh, the kind of bad work of uh, the circulation of images that you're describing. Um, that, yeah, I'm I, concerned I understand. about the ethics yeah. of this, of this work sure. and this performance. Yeah, obviously, uh, sadness is one of the many, uh, you know, e emotional or uh, affects uh, that uh, uh, are being triggered and that are being exploited, right? So I invite everyone uh, here to um, write similar stories, do similar research uh, on how uh, technology is, uh, is provoking certain um, 
you know, emotional responses in us. Uh, this can be anger, uh, it can be uh, boredom, uh, it can, you know, uh, there's a lot of literature and stuff going on already uh, about uh, loneliness. Now, whether the, these things are universal, uh, I don't say. I'm, I don't, not, I'm not making any claim. But you uh, are, because you keep using we no, and please, us. Uh, we, I'm and we not have making to any claim that this is, uh, you know, related to the Chinese internet, the biggest uh, internet, uh, you know, section of the world. Obviously, uh, you know, Chinese scholars will have to uh, look very c carefully how, for instance, in that uh, vast uh, country, uh, you know, th uh, th these things are, are being played out and we'll have to make, uh, you know, a, a local or a regional whatever uh, analysis. Uh, and I would uh, only, uh, uh, you know, stimulate, uh, st stimulate that. Um, all, I all I can say is that it, it's a vast arsenal of different responses. And what we hear uh, in the mainstream media is only you know, about anger and face, fake news, obviously. You know, it, it's not the sadness that is mostly reported. No, it's, it's, it's the anger, the trolls, the shit storms, etc. But sadness itself is not a universal <coughs> Please, emotion. can we um, cut that conversation here? Because um, we actually should now close the uh, whole event. But uh, I promised one last question to Manuel over there. Who? <laughs> yeah, super. Uh, sorry, Christopher, two questions, one to each of you. Um, I found the music a bit disturbing um, because I didn't see the relation to social media. Could you elaborate on this? Because the pictures were like super literal. And the other thing is, maybe to get, is like why would you talk one hour about set by design if the talk, if we listen to the last 10 minutes, should be happy by design? and should be more uh, progressive. Pro like, progressive. Uh, should be more progressive in a way of putting ideas together instead of, I mean, we, we know that we are set by design, isn't it? So what is, wh how can you, why would you talk about it if you are really into changing it? Yeah, okay, well, one, of the, one of the problems is, of course, when you dig into this, uh, you enter the abyss yourself. Right? And this is the problem when you study it, uh, there's, there's a big chance uh, you're not getting out, uh, out of this yourself. And I have to say, uh, there were times and still are when I, when I, I get that feeling, right? So um, we need to make that direct connection between this, these types of investigations and the alternatives. Without it, uh, you know, we're really uh, entering uh, a, a quite a dangerous uh, uh, ter territory, and that's why I firmly believe that these two things need to go uh, hand in hand. I think with that statement, thanks again to We're Not Sick, and thank you for listening.